My lovely imps, we have to talk about Joe Biden. Yes, yes, yes. The discourse has been off the chain, okay? This has been one of the weirdest and strangest discourse cycles in politics that I've ever seen in my entire life. And uh, I've seen a lot of weird ones, okay? The basic thing for those who've been out of the loop is that the first presidential debate of 2024 happened just two days ago. And it was an unmitigated disaster, okay? Truly an unmitigated disaster. Um, the, the debate was hosted on CNN. It was done without a live audience, which was an interesting decision. And it was strictly moderated, meaning that they could mute mics if uh, Trump or Biden went over time, which led to some very weird moments. Uh, however, the format wasn't really just the only weird part about that. The weirdest part about that was the fact that Trump and Biden were both really weird. But Biden was so weird. So weird, in fact, that in for the last 48 hours or so, there has been a legitimate uh, panic among the democratic sphere of politically interested parties. So I'm talking news. I'm talking e editorial writers. I'm talking political analysts, talking heads of all types, uh, streamers, um, uh, p political org leadership, uh, basically anybody that you can imagine who's heavily politically involved on the Democrat side of things has been in fight or flight for about 48 hours since the debate happened. It is w extremely strange. We're going to go through some of, uh, some of the examples of this. Um, with one particular example standing out above all of the rest, which we're going to get to in just a minute. Uh, but it has gotten to the point that even Democratic stronghold uh, newspapers, such as the New York Times, uh, have begun to float the idea of replacing Biden as a candidate. Now, for people outside of the U.S., that might be like, well, okay, don't you do different candidates all the time? And the answer is no. Uh, in the United States, it is incredibly, incredibly rare that an incumbent, meaning somebody who's currently in the position, does not run again. It is spectacularly rare, um, in fact. And uh, it, is all, it is particularly rare for it to happen this late in the game. Now, to be fair, we are currently um, still a decent way away from the official deadline for the Democratic Party deciding on its candidate. Um, every election year, there is an event called uh, the Democratic National Convention, and it's a literal convention where all of the Democratic Party leadership gets together, and they do a bunch of different things, and they ultimately, by the end of it, decide on who is going to be who they put forward as president. Normally, it is essentially guaranteed that it will be the incumbent. But there is currently a massive panic. And uh, this panic is relevant for a number of reasons. First of all, because, because to this point, there is the, the, the Democratic machine has been completely behind Biden. Within the Democratic Party, there has been zero breaking of rank whatsoever. And that's pretty uncommon. Usually, within the Democratic Party, there's always at least some level of people who are going, yeah, you know, what about me? You know, hey. But they've been 100% behind Biden. And the sudden breaking at the time of this debate seems to indicate that... Sentiments have been much lower than anybody was willing to admit. What we have seen is, uh, is a breaking of morale, a rout 
where one person started to panic and everyone else started to panic because what was in front of them was undeniable. It got to the point that uh, in an interview with Vice President Kamala Harris, uh, inter interviewer Anderson Cooper was willing to interrupt the vice president to to basically be like, you you must understand that that was a bad debate. Like, you, you can't tell us that that wasn't a bad debate. That's how bad it got. Um, now, there's been a ton of discourse back and forth all over the place as to how much this will affect the electorate. And I have seen all kinds of opinions. Personally, I believe that this debate while not necessarily viewed directly by a lot of the electorate, um, is almost certainly going to severely affect the electorate. And I'm I want to explain why. Um, a lot of people will come forward and say, well, you know, debates are usually just watched by politics heads, okay? Which is true. Your everyday people by and large, do not tune in for a presidential debate. They got other stuff going on. They got their lives and whatever, and it's not their primary passion. They hear about it through the news. They hear about it through social media. They hear about it through trusted sources, you know, whether it's a streamer or a, or a, a show that they like to watch or a radio show that they like to listen to. So while it is true that a lot of people don't tune in to the debate directly, a lot of people will be hearing about the debate through the grapevine, and they will be seeing bits and pieces of the debate. And unfortunately, there are almost no moments in that debate where Donald Trump looks bad, and there are a number of moments where Joe Biden appears to quite literally be having a mental episode. It is really bad on that front. There is a particular moment in the debate, which if you haven't seen the debate, I recommend you go watch my coverage of it. We made it a lot of fun. We did a uh, maximalism stream, so go check that out. It's on my channel. Just look up the debate. Um, but uh, there was a moment in this debate where Joe Biden attempted to answer a question about health care, uh, completely lost his train of thought, struggled, looked down at the floor, mumbled in, literally incoherently for a number of seconds, and then returned to look at the camera saying something completely unrelated about Medicaid, saying that we beat Medicaid. It was very bad. It looked, it was the most stereotypical, uh, severe senior moment that you could possibly imagine. And Joe Biden's age is one of the most, uh, like it or not, it is, there are some problematic elements to the obsession with age. Obviously, there's a lot of older people who are doing just fine and kicking it out there. A lot of people, in fact, in the follow-up have been posting examples of older politicians who are much sharper than Joe Biden and are older than him. Um, so it isn't really just about age, but nonetheless, his age-related struggles are a big concern for an enormous portion of America. And in my personal experience, in addition to the data that we have from polling, a lot of people are very concerned about it. You have to keep in mind that Joe Biden has had a lot of moments that make him come off as um, not all there, okay? And it's not 100% fair. Some of it is just, you know, uh, stumbles, or mispronunciations, or losing his train of thought, something that happens to everybody. Um, but if you'll look back with me over the past couple of presidents for a little bit, uh, George Bush was roasted by millions upon millions of people worldwide for being a little bit of a yokel and for saying things in a dumb way and for making up words that weren't real. Uh, even if it was kind of, un you could understand what he was saying. He just kind of made up words that weren't really, like he squished two words together. Um, and, uh, and that was George Bush. And he suffered from that because it gave off the impression he was bad. 
Obama, an incredible public speaker, like him or, or, or hate him, Obama was an incredibly talented public speaker, was uh, constantly uh, dug into for saying um and uh all the time. And of course, with Obama, that one didn't really stick all that hard, but it goes to show you how easy it is to spread that. Almost, almost every single Obama impersonation and critique was like, he can barely speak. He says, um and uh all the time. And uh, even if that didn't actually affect the electorate because it was so, it was kind of baseless, it shows how easily that kind of, uh, that kind of messaging can spread. And with Joe Biden, that kind of messaging can spread super easily, but it also has real substance. Because when, when he can't really operate without a teleprompter, when he is asked to do like critical thinking and respond on the fly, and he has total shutdowns into the level of incoherence that are horrifying to watch, that are genuinely like gut-wrenching to watch, seeing Biden completely lose what he was talking about, start mumbling and saying words, like no no words, just going, uh, 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 and then stuttering out some unrelated line that doesn't even make sense, and then having Trump go, I don't know if he knows what he's talking about at this point. Brutal, okay? Just brutal. Um, it's a very, very big problem in my opinion and that is one that i don't think you can dismiss by just saying well a lot of people didn't watch the debate first of all a lot of people did watch the debate but secondly uh it is highly memeable let's put it that way and if people go to try and find out more about it they will discover that no indeed he did actually have that happen in the middle of a conversation and the mods just kind of had to like shuffle him out they literally just had to go uh Thank you. Your time's up. We'll stop now. Uh, it's a really, really, really bad look. Secondly, uh, as to why I I don't necessarily think that the you know you know everyday politics you know, everyday voters not watching the debate why I don't think that's really a good a good thing to 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 bet on here is the fact that. All of the people who people listen to to get their opinions about the debate are in a panic. And it was a very organic panic, uh, to, put it, to put it bluntly. Um, there was, the panic was so rapid and so inarguable that there was no room to spin. There was no time to coordinate. Nobody could. They had to just react on the spot. And their reaction was universally across basically all Democratic and Republican news sources, like leaning news sources, um, was to go, oh, that's really bad. Oh, my God. And those are the people that your, uh, your voters, your everyday voters are going to go, well, maybe I should find out what uh, what Morning Joe has to say about this. Maybe I should go find out what Maddow has to say about this. Maybe I should go find out what uh, what Anderson Cooper has to say about this. You know, when they go, oh, well, you know, maybe we should go see. Hell, it even reached people like Jon Stewart, who was like, oh my god. So... It's a rough situation. These, these things and my concerns for how this is going to actually affect the election is that this will be a massive, massive def deflationary force uh, towards uh, people actually showing up to vote. That is the biggest concern. Um, it will also be a deflationary force towards people donating. It will also be a deflationary force towards people wanting to volunteer for the Democratic Party. But I don't think that those matter as much as uh, the voter apathy that this type of event uh, can inspire. Now, it is true 
that Donald Trump is very unliked and that uh, people are motivated to vote against Donald Trump. However, that is because there is a sense of confidence or there has been a sense of confidence that Joe Biden can actually beat him. And if that morale starts to flag, well then people's emotions, their hearts are going to start to wane. They're going to go, oh, maybe, maybe it doesn't matter that much, you know, whatever. What could I really do anyway? And they're not going to want to go vote at all. And I'm not talking about lefties. I'm not talking about people who are super politically involved. I'm talking about your everyday, you know, Joe out there, your everyday voter who uh, goes, oh, wait, voting's coming up soon. I should probably go vote. Well, if, it, if in their mind, the last thing they remember is seeing Joe Biden falling asleep on the stage and they don't like Trump, they might go, oh, oh yeah, I got to vote. But also, I got a pot pie in the oven. Like, forget it. You know? It's one of those things that I, I worry strongly about. And it is possible that this debate does not have an impact. But I think that it would be foolish. It would be a borderline, a borderline copium haze level uh, disconnected to disregard the fact that literally every Democrat stronghold is right now currently in panic mode and that the Democratic Party upper echelons, the Biden administration, those closest to Biden, are truly wheeling out every person uh, who they can possibly get out to, uh, to, to, to support Biden right now. Let me give you an example of that. Actually, let me give you two examples real quick. Hold on, let me just get these up here for you. All right? Let's see. Hold on. Give me just a second here. I want to show you guys. I want to show you these. Okay? Here we go. So first off, we got Obama. Obama on Twitter. Bad debate nights happen. Trust me. I know. But this election is still a choice between someone who's fought for ordinary folks his entire life and someone who ca only cares about himself. Between someone who tells the truth, who knows right from wrong and will give it to the American people straight, and someone who lies through his teeth for his own benefit. Last night didn't change that, and it's why so much is at stake in November. Now you might go, oh, well, Obama's being really positive about it. Except he's not. Obama, who is Joe's number one guy, he's his, he's, Obama was the president when Joe Biden was vice president. They're like, their public image is like this. Bi o Obama intervened in order to make sure that Biden got the nomination. And if Obama is having to basically do a, a post that's like, guys, it was bad. Yeah, it was bad. But don't worry about it. That's, that's concerning. But it wasn't just Obama, okay? Obama was, is a pretty major one to be popping out. We got Bill Clinton, which is absolutely wild. To roll out Bill Clinton, to call in a favor from Bill Clinton so Bill Clinton can go on social media and post about it. Let's read what Bill Clinton had to say. I'll leave the debate rating to the pundits, sidestepping the obvious concern. This right here is a, is a tell. But here's what I know. Facts and history matter. Joe Biden has given us three years of solid leadership, steadying us after the pandemic, creating a record number of new jobs, making real progress solving the climate crisis, and launching a successful effort in reducing inflation, all while pulling us out of the quagmire Donald Trump left us in. That's what's really at stake in November. Except there's a problem with all of this. So obviously, first of all, he sidesteps in the beginning and admits that the debate was bad implicitly by saying, I'm not going to talk about the debate, you know. <laughs> we know what everybody's saying about it, which is that it was a disaster, an unmitigated, nightmarish disaster that has sent the Democratic Party into an absolute panic. But, you know, Joe Biden's done a good job for the last three years. 
But the concern that people are having, of course, the people who are really worried about this and who are interested in the future of politics in this country, the worry that people have is genuinely not necessarily whether Joe Biden personally did a good job as president. It's whether he can actually beat Donald Trump. That is the question at hand right now. And the showing of the debate seems very strongly to indicate that Joe Biden is not necessarily in a position to be able to beat Trump. Or at the very least, that his position is so, uh, it's been called into question so deeply that there's a genuine concern that running Biden might just be handing the election to Trump. Now, those are the two people who rolled out in order to weigh in on this nightmare discourse. Now, let me tell you, I have been keeping my eyes on liberal Twitter. I have been keeping my eyes on, I've watched multiple other shows discuss this issue. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about this, okay? But I want to show you all, I want you all to watch with me one particular show that I think is very telling, okay? Which is, of course, MSNBC's morning show, morning politics show, called Morning Joe. Now, Morning Joe is a very popular Democratic show, and most importantly, it is the show that has repeatedly uh, been, uh, been shouted out as the president's favorite politics show. This is the show that is, like, I'm talking, this is the Joe Biden, uh, you, know, you know in Rocky where he's, you know, getting his shoulders got all punched up and he's gotten, getting his shoulders massaged and, and Mickey's telling him, you can do this, you got this, you just got to avoid that punch. That's Morning Joe. Morning Joe is Joe Biden's back massage, water, and, uh, and, and towel. Get back in the fight, Joe. You got this. I want you to watch the conversation that went on Morning Joe, a show that Joe Biden has admitted to watching himself the morning after the debate. Let's watch this together. What I'm going to do is fix the tax system. For example, we have a thousand trillionaires in America. I mean, billionaires in America. And what's happening? They're in a situation where they, in fact, pay 8.2% in taxes. If they just paid 24%, 25%, either one of those numbers. I mean, they've raised $500 million, billion dollars, I should say, in a 10-year period. We'd be able to right wipe out his debt. We'd be able to help make sure that all those things we need to do, child care, elder care, making sure that we continue. Russ Evan, do you have a link to that? I didn't see the follow-up. I'd love to see the follow-up. We need to strengthen our health care system, making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the... Uh, with, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare. After you rallied. This is the show, once again, let me just remind you, this is the show most in Joe Biden's corner, and they open their segment with that. Remember how I said that, uh, it's not just people who watch the debate, but that that moment is unbelievably memeable. It's going to be re that is every if people see anything from the debate, that is what they are going to see. And this is this is the Dems are making sure that everybody see it because it's if you don't, you look like a liar. It was so bad that you have no choice but to show it and talk about it. Let's continue your supporters that day. Some of them stormed the Capitol to stop the constitutionally mandated counting of electoral votes. As president, you swore an oath to, quote, preserve, protect, and defend, unquote, the Constitution. What do you say to voters who believe that you violated that oath through your actions and inaction on January 6th and worry that you'll do it again? Well, I don't think too many believe that. And let me tell you about January 6th. On January 6th, we had a great border. Nobody coming through, very few. 
On January 6th, we were energy independent. On January 6th, we had the lowest taxes ever. You have 80 seconds left. My question was, what do you say to those voters who believe that you violated your constitutional oath through your actions and inaction on January 6th, 2021, and worry that you'll do it again? Well, I didn't say that to anybody. I said peacefully and patriotically. And Nancy Pelosi, if you just watched the news from two days ago, on tape to her daughter, who's a documentary filmmaker, they say, but she's saying, oh, no, it's my responsibility. I was responsible for this because I offered her 10,000 soldiers or National Guard and she turned them down. I had virtually nothing to do. They asked me to go make a speech. Look, he encouraged those folks to go up in the Capitol. No, it didn't, Fortnite. It did not. Um, so this is what they're trying to show for Trump. And I want you to try and just put yourself in the mind if you can, put aside your, like, political brain. You know, most likely if you're politically active, you care about January 6th a lot and all that. But if you put it aside for a second, which of those two clips was more emotionally impactful to you? Because I know which one immediately. I know the answer. I think most of you do, too. Well, what they've done to some people that are so innocent... You ought to be ashamed of yourself. What you have done, how you've destroyed the lives of so many people. All right, two moments that in many ways defined last night's debate. Donald Trump's performance included his usual stream of grievances, along with many false and misleading claims. However, as you saw in that first clip, the debate was particularly rough for President Biden. Concerns about his age, perhaps his biggest weakness, according to polls, were on full display as he struggled through many of his responses, speaking with a soft, hoarse voice which his campaign blamed on a cold. Good morning and welcome to Morning Joe. It is Friday, June 28th, along with Joe, Willie and me. We have the host of Way Too Early, White House. Do you think the emotional, Russ Seven says, do you think the emotional reaction might be biased? I've seen multiple reports that undecided voters are not reacting the same way that Democrats did. Um, I would be very surprised. Um, it is certainly possible. Maybe undecided voters are truly do not care at all about that. And it, that's always a possibility. Never underestimate the possibility for Americans to not give a shit. Um, but also, I f find it very difficult to believe that uh, the average undecided voter was like, listening to Donald Trump and going, ah, excuse me, fact check, fact check, oh, fact check. I think they heard D Donald Trump and went, oh, yeah, he sounds like Donald Trump. And then they probably saw Biden and went, what the hell happened? Spirit Chief at Politico, Jonathan Lemire, NBC News. I could be wrong. Politics is very unpredictable. But what I'm trying to do is bring up the concerns that I see based on uh, the best knowledge that I have at my fingertips. National Affairs Analyst John Heilman is also a partner and chief political columnist at Puck. They are both at the debate side in Atlanta. MS true high progressive. True. NBC contributor Mike Barnacle joins us and pulled surprise winning columnist and associate editor of The Washington Post and MSNBC political analyst Eugene Robinson. It's good to have you all on board. I think we should begin with Joe Willie and me and get your reflections on the debate last night. Well, um, I think I should start by saying, uh, without any apologies, uh, that I love Joe Biden and. Uh <laughs> Remember what I was just like two minutes ago talking about how these guys are like, they're the number one Joe show. Joe Biden, I need to. I, I love you, Joe Biden. You are basically my grandfather, and I love you. I love when I imagine coming over to your house and getting butterscotch candies from that dish on your, uh, on your counter. Uh, Jill, and I will gladly debate anybody, anytime, any place, anywhere over the issue of whether Joe Biden has been the most effective president. 
in passing bipartisan legislation, in expanding NATO, in responding to the rising chat, uh, threat coming from China, uh, by flexing America's uh, strength uh, around China, by having the strongest economy in the world, bar none, the strongest economy actually relative to the rest of the world uh, in 50, 60, 70 years, the strongest dollar in half a century. I see people in chat saying this is a compliment sandwich. If this is a compliment sandwich, this is one of those meme sandwiches that people post on TikTok that have like, like uh, way too many ingredients and then they dump cheese all over it. This is like the fucking, this is like, this is like shaggy sandwich in Scooby-Doo where he has to unhinge his jaw and go, oh, zoinks. Um, the strongest military relative to the rest of the world, I would argue, and many others would argue, since 1945, I think, his presidency has been an unqualified success. If, however, you believe, as do I, and as do so many people who watch this program and who... Um, fear, uh, just h how dark of a place a second Donald Trump term will take America, then I think it's critical that we ask the same questions about this man I love, respect, uh, and, uh, and whose who's public service in saving this country from it sounds like he's reading an obituary, says Sweet Blasphemy. Right? Unironically, this sounds like a speech that you would deliver at a funeral. Donald Trump, over the last three and a half years, I honor and always will. I think we have to ask the same questions of him that we have asked of Donald Trump since 2016. And that is, if he were CEO, and he turned into a performance like that. Would any corporation in America, any Fortune 500 corporation? He not only had to sandwich it with a mountain of compliments, but he's also having to filter it through a questionable metaphor. If he were a, a CEO of a company, it's like, he's already the president. Like, what are you doing? Just, oh my God. Corporation in America keep him on as CEO. Um, if this were Donald Trump, uh, time and time again, we talked about the Goldwater. Where is the Barry Goldwater? To walk over and tell Richard Nixon it was over. To tell Donald Trump it was over. And now the question is, do Democrats need to do the same thing of Joe Biden? I mean, these, these are hard. Oh, that is brutal. Barry Goldwater was a, uh, a, a, a former, and well, actually, I believe it was afterwards. He ran for president afterwards, but he was a uh, Republican political advisor uh, who basically had to tell Nick, like he said, he basically had to tell Nixon, like, dude, you're done. You got to stop. You're not winning. He was also, yes, a very, very bad person, extreme racist. Uh, yeah, uh, I think later he tried to run and lost the nomination to, re to Reagan. Uh, he tried to run, uh, uh, he tried to run on a more racist pl platform than Reagan. Yeah. Hard questions, but the fact is, friends, Failure is just not an option. In 2024, failure is not an option. So who I love, who I respect, who I revere for their work and their duty to service over their lifetime really is not relevant. It's not relevant for any of us. It's not relevant for Democratic leaders. It's not relevant for anyone. The question is, can we know Joe Biden can govern? Mm -hmm. And again, I'll debate that issue with anyone and I will win. I will destroy anybody that wants to debate Joe Biden's record 
over the past three and a half years. He can run the White House. He can run the country effectively. Still stacking on those ingredients. Another, another salami, another ham, two more slices of Swiss, a pickle. D despite the barrage of lies that constantly come at him, like Donald Trump's lies last night. But can he run for president in 2024? Donald Trump lied over and over and over and over again. And Joe Biden couldn't respond to any of those lies. In fact, as the New York Times said, he spent much of the night with his mouth agape and his eyes darting back and forth. He couldn't fact check anything Donald Trump said. And not only that, he missed one layup after another, after another. In this segment, even though we talked about it during the debate, but in this segment, I haven't even mentioned how badly he bungled his, his response about abortion. Joe Biden was given an easy, softball answer to, to talk about abortion, and he ended up pivoting into talking about uh, an, an, immigrant, an alleged immigrant uh, murderer? It was, it was, what, just why? Abortion is like his golden issue. It is the, it is the issue that is carrying him. It is the golden egg. It was absurd. He couldn't respond effectively to Donald Trump trying to overthrow American democracy on January 6th. He couldn't respond effectively to Donald Trump's continued stream of lies about his own record, and he couldn't even respond effectively on the issue of abortion, where for some reason, he darted wildly to the issue of immigration. And on immigration, as I said yesterday morning, any Democrat that can't turn to their Republican opponent and blast them for killing the strongest, toughest border bill in the history of America, drafted by a right-wing senator. Also, I just want to take a moment. Did we all just did we all just hear that line? This has been the response from the Joe Biden administration. Not only are they currently in complete disarray. Not only did they get to the point that they put a obviously incapable of debating Joe Biden out there. We're all seeing this as the regular folks. We don't have the inside. They all knew how bad it was, and they put him out there anyway. But on top of that, they're sitting here acting as if it's a win to have their entire team accepting the most far-right policies you can imagine to try and appease people who will not even care. In the debate, Donald Trump literally made fun of him for doing it. He was like, huh, you put the most far right thing in and it's it's not even good enough. It's trash. It's stupid. It won't help anything. Who gives a shit? Massive moment of appeasal. It pissed off. That immigration bill pissed off so many Democrats. It pissed off the entire left. It pissed off a lot of Democrats who have strong feelings about immigration. It pissed off everybody who isn't a right-leaning Democrat. And it got... Nothing. They implemented a fascist policy as a favor for nothing. For literally nothing. And this is not this is not just the last time they'll do it. They've tried to do this already at multiple points. We now see that what the Joe Biden administration thinks is a good strategy is appeasement. Do you remember when there was uh when just a few months ago, Greg Abbott was implying that he was going to secede from the union over his right to put barbed wire into the water where many, ch where there are many children brought across the border, and and uh, uh, he wanted to use National Guard troops to do so, and there was a conflict, and Biden basically said, Ah, actually, you know what, bro, <laughs> you can have this one. Incredible. Actually deranged. 
And by the way, this is the end state of liberalism. Liberalism is incapable of successfully responding to the far right. Their only response is to delay. And when the delays can no longer work, they begin to capitulate. And before long, they're hand in hand. They're working side by side. They might be crying about it on their pillows at night, but they're ultimately capitulating. Joe Biden put in, as in the words of his favorite show, of everybody's little favorite Democratic morning show, the strongest, firmest, most cruel is what they're trying to say. The most cruel and harsh border, border policies ever dreamed up by a Democrat. And they're boasting that they did that. really makes you feel like you're in good hands. That's really going to motivate a lot of people who are Democrats because, Demo because the Democratic Party is supposed to be different than the Republicans. That's going to make them feel a lot of energy, right? That's definitely not going to deflate anyone and make, people, make a group of people who are already extremely apathetic about politics feel even more apathetic about politics. And it gets worse because today the Biden administration on the same, at almost the exact same time that they put out a tweet on social media saying, we see you, we hear you, LGBT community. The Biden team also put out a statement that they are no longer going to support uh, legally uh, the protection of gender-affirming care for children. We're going to talk about that. A whole segment is coming up next about that. Oh, don't believe me? Hold on. Let me bring it up. Let me just get that for you. They gave a statement to the New York Times this morning. Boop. Here you go. The Biden administration said this week that it opposed gender-affirming surgery for minors. The most explicit statement to date on the subject from a president who has otherwise been a staunch supporter of transgender rights. If you missed it, that was because it happened, what, last yesterday evening and then this morning we got hit with the, uh, we got hit with the, uh, it says surgery specifically. Are you, and? We're going to do a whole segment on that next. Let's continue. We have a, a perfect, two perfect examples of Joe Biden's only tactic being appeasement to the farthest right wing to get nothing. Joe Biden is not a president who is in the position to be able to adapt and respond to the far right. From Oklahoma, may not be up to the job. And so, that's the question. I know people are waiting and say, oh, and, and David Pluff, I have such great respect for David Pluff. He said we need to wait three or four days because Donald Trump really turned off swing voters uh, in, 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 in a lot of focus groups once they saw him again. And that makes a lot of sense. But the door was opened so many times. This race should not be close. We've been asking, why is this race close? We have no idea why this race is close. We saw last night why this race has been close and why I fear Donald Trump will be the next president of the United States unless things change. And I will say, Mika, the one thing that I know that you believe it may have been because he was sick. Mm -hmm. And and I'm, I'm open to that fact because I'll just say, I, as I've said on the show, I spent three hours with this man, maybe back in March, three hours, cogent, on top of the issues, on top of every issue around the world. Uh, and last night, he simply was not on the biggest debate stage ever. And I think what surprised me and what surprised a lot of people very close to Joe Biden is the fact that this man always rises to the occasion. And last night was, was sadly for him, and I believe for Democrats in this country, um, and, and again, if you believe 
what's at stake at this election is mm -hmm. what we believe is at stake. I'll even use the word tragically. He tragically did not rise to the occasion last night. Okay, uh, so as you can see, you won't see us spinning here on Morning Joe uh, at all. Um, but let me tell you what I believe, and then we'll go to... Come on! Come on! You just had to build a 12-layer a cake to say, damn, Joe Biden really goofed it bad and everybody could tell. And you're telling me there's no spin when you had to glaze him for literally 10 minutes and 46 seconds. Sorry, not literally. Literally approximately 9 minutes and 46 seconds because the first minute was you showing the actual clips. Come on. Willie, um, B Biden had a terrible night. He could not land a thought. Not even in the closing statement, which is something, that's the easiest part. Write down a few words, go through them go through the thoughts. Um, and while I validate the chaos uh, and hysteria Democrats might be feeling, anybody who cares about democracy might be feeling, anybody who cares about women's rights and our safety and our lives might be feeling, totally understand that. Um, and at the same time as the night was over and I was, I was hearing you on the phone and all our phones were exploding, I just had this gut feeling that I'm not ready to give up on Joe Biden, not even close. Oh Joe Biden God. has lost more in his life than he has won in every way, especially politically. This man has. And by the way, that is a sentiment that is currently shared by the Joe Biden administration. Because they released a statement as well. Let me give you the, uh, let me bring up that statement. Because Joe Biden thinks he did great. In fact, in fact, he thinks he did, he did so good that they released this statement. As reported on CNN, not only does the POTUS not plan to drop out, Biden remains committed to do a second debate in September, a Biden advisor tells me. Well, lost and lost, and, 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 and the only time that he wins is when it matters. And that is, we have proof of that. He has lost in personal ways. He has lost and hit rock bottom in every way possible. And every time he comes back fighting. So for me, watching what happened last night, again, it was terrible. It was terrible. There's no way to spin it. I still. I wonder what he's going to look like in a week. I wonder if he was sick. He came out on the stage and I thought something was wrong. Um, I still believe this is all wonderful. All of this is incredibly good to have happen right before the election happens. We are just a few months away from the election. Actually, oh my God. He's the best choice for this country, even with that performance last night, because he was standing next to a man who represents fascism, who doesn't believe in this country and would not even agree to the results of this election if they were free and fair to him. A man who has incited a riot a man who tried to overturn the election, a man who's liable of sexual abuse, a man who is a fraudster. Kenneth Allen Cook says, please tell me he can win. Why would you ever ask me to do that? <laughs> you, want, you want me to just like, would you like me to sing you a lullaby too? Like what? I have been talking about how concerned I am about Joe Biden that Joe Biden was an incredibly risky candidate to, rent, to run, and it's just proving that he's even riskier than ever. There is no way, nobody in the entire country should have confidence in Joe Biden at all. You should not have confidence in Joe Biden. No one should. Is it possible that he wins? Anything's possible. Of course, they're like neck and neck in the polls before this debate. We'll have to see how it goes after that, but we all know that the polls are a toss-up anyway. Anything's possible, but, but, but 
a sh- like a a confident vote? Should you be confident in Joe Biden? Absolutely fucking not. Absolutely not. No way. Not only that, I think his chances are very bad at this point. On a personal level, I do not have confidence. I think that it is it would be more prudent to gamble on the fact that Donald Trump will win come November. That is what that is where I am at looking at this. I see when I look at this, what I see is a Democratic Party that is completely delusional a Democratic Party that is having a massive morale break and they literally do not have the mechanisms to make him step step down because they have built an administration that is entirely centered on Joe Biden and his team. There is no alternatives. They have not prepared for any alternatives. I see a, a Democratic Party that does not actually take uh, Republicans seriously and that continues to bat right anyway, pissing off large portions of their own voter base which when you piss off your voter base enough, they start to get apathetic and they won't show up. I think personally that we should recognize that there is a very good chance that Joe Biden has completely sunk his chances and has essentially handed the election to Donald Trump. It's possible he wins, but I don't think that you should uh, gamble on something unlikely to happen and, and then let that lead you to inaction. For people out there who are worried about this, we should begin to think about, before it happens, what will four more years under Trump look like, and how do we work against that? How do we protect ourselves from that? How do we protect loved ones from that? How do we protect other people from that? I think it is beyond foolish to gamble on Joe Biden I think it has been foolish to gamble on Joe Biden for a very long time. But I think it is incredibly foolish at this juncture to gamble that Joe Biden even has a positive chance of winning. I think that if he wins, it will be the unlikely circumstance. I think that we can, at this moment, at this particular juncture, I think that Trump has a good shot at it. Let's hope Demon Mom is wrong. I would love to be wrong. I would really, really like it if i was if i was wrong but i don't i don't know like the democratic party is pulling out all the stops right now this panic indicates that within the democratic party they are trying to do everything they can to change course the fact that basically every super embedded news show uh on 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 in america right now is trying to convince biden to step down every pundit every person that we can see and there is a vanguard around joe biden that is unwilling to take action and that joe biden's only response bet has been no nah, i'm gonna do it again in september jack i don't care how bad it went that is very bad that is that indicates that there is not even a machine that could even if even the most influential voices within the Democratic Party outside of the president himself are unable to make to force a change, there is not the political energy to do that. That's really bad. Kenneth Allen Cook says, do you think that Biden can be replaced? Yes, I do think that he can be. I think it's possible. I imagine there is some way for it to be done. Will he be? I don't know. I want to tell people that, like, you should just say it. If you think, if you're losing faith in Joe Biden, you should tell that to people. You should tell that to other people. You should go and tell your, your representatives that. You should tell any, if you have connections to people within the Democratic Party, you should voice that. that the only way that there's any chance of this changing is if, there's, if enough pressure builds up. And even then, it's looking like Joe Biden is about to flip a giant bird to everyone who isn't in his own administration and say, you got me. All this freaking out is what is killing it for the Dems. The total loss in, mor in morale is due to this media freak out. No, 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 no. You, you, I think that's not, I don't think that's a, a correct read for a number of reasons. These sentiments are not new. 
Those of us who are not tied to the Democratic Party, but who are nonetheless interested in politics and opposed to Trump, people like me, people like other uh, lefty creators, have been out here voicing the exact same. And I said this on the night of the debate, we have been articulated, articulating pointed critiques at Joe Biden. These are not new. This was not like a grand revelation for people within the party. They just recognized a sea change. The debate represents a moment in which it was it was no longer. You would have to be insane. You would you come off as a complete psycho to try and deny that Joe Biden didn't completely mess up in on a Nash international stage. You know, it was crystal clear. It's a moment. You know the term of like uh, the rats jumping off the ship. It's basically when it gets to a point that even the rats that live in the, the, the wet underbelly of the ship are too scared because the ship has gotten so low in the water. That's what we're witnessing. We are witnessing complete abandonment. And that is a, that is a resolution of already existing critiques that were not being listened to. It's a bubble popping. It's gotten, it was going like this and it was bursting and getting bigger and a bunch of people were going, oh my God, that shit's gonna blow. And then it blew. This is the blow. I really, s s some of you all gotta, gotta take a moment, okay? And just breathe, okay? One of the things that I, I just, I just wanna, this is getting to be a really bulky segment, but I also need to re reiterate, Donald Trump winning was always a possibility. If you're the type of person who's been sitting here for the last four years and just been going, <laughs> whatever. Like, Donald Trump will never win again. Joe Biden's got this in the bag. Um, why would you never, as a politically involved person, consider the fact that things might not go your way? And how come when it, when someone points out, oh shit, things might not be going our, our way, is like the response to like, throw up your hands and be like, it's fucking over. We're, we're done. We're, it's, I'm, I'm giving up. It's like the fight isn't over until it's over. We're not even close, okay? He's not even in office yet. It was all, it's always been a possibility that Donald Trump gets in power. In fact, here in this space, on this channel, I have spent a lot of time specifically talking about the fact that I think it's a good chance that Donald Trump or a right-wing force takes power in this country and that we have to contend with that. This has always been a possibility. It is not a nice thing to have to contend with, but you need to be able to acknowledge it without freaking the fuck out Take your moment to be like, that sucks, it hurts. But you also have to be able to go, all right, this was a possibility. I knew this was a possibility. How do we start thinking about what we will do? How do we start thinking about how we will survive? What we will do to make things better for other people? What we will do to make things better for ourselves? Well, that was a bad gamble, Kenneth Allen Cook. Not to be, not to, not to dunk, dunk down on you, but the idea that the, the idea that Donald Trump would actually go to prison was like the smallest likelihood ever. He's a former president of the United States. Putting him in prison is like the la like it is like so unlikely. It would have to be a miracle. Of course, it would have been funny. We'd love to have seen it, but a billionaire in jail, let alone a former president of the United States, that's just not what happens. It just doesn't happen in America. A man who is a convicted felon. So many times Joe Biden has hit rock bottom. Last night was one of them. And I'm, I'm just not going to jump to conclusions here and jump on the hysteria train. I am rocked a little bit by it, didn't like it, was really worried. But I really, truly believe in him as a president and as a human being. Hey there, MSNBC fans. I'm Luke Russell. All right, so that's the end of that of that MSNBC little bit here. I wanted to show a hey, uh, I wanted to show another little funny headline. Okay, just that's kind of 
emblematic of this, okay? Here we go. This was the change in Chiron. Sources. Dems saying we have a problem after Biden's performance tonight. The Chiron changes. Sources. Aggressive panic for Dems after Biden's performance tonight. I believe that it would be foolish to not acknowledge that this is a real problem. I think that writing, um, writing off uh, the complete morale break in the entire democratic machine at the moment um, is that would be strategically foolish for anyone who isn't invested in basically just feeling good about the machine that they're in. None of us here are democratic operatives that I know of. Some of you in chat, maybe one of you in chat is. If you are, please figure out a way to make a change in course, a severe change in course. I do think there are ways that Biden could turn this around. I think Biden could, uh, could find a aggressive... Um, political issue to, to make a big change on. I joked in the past that like destroying all student loans would probably instantly win him the election, no questions asked. Same thing goes for like federal legalization of marijuana. If he found out a way to do that, to just like do some dark horse stuff. But I'm gonna be completely honest, he doesn't seem interested in that. He hasn't done it so far. I don't think that they're like waiting on it. He seems confident in his performance and he's cons he's already promised to do another debate publicly. That is fucking not good. Okay? And uh to summarize up why I wanted to talk about this particular back and forth, this whole should we care about the debate? Should we not care about the debate? Well, first of all, if you're here, you probably watch the debate. So obviously you already do care about the debate. Secondly, uh, everyone, all of the second order and third order and maybe even fourth order debate carers. So like not only are the people who watch the debate and, and are invested in it, but all the people who watch the people who watch the people and all the people who watch the people who watch the people who listen to the people who watch the people, all of those people are freaking out. And me being a little bit used to watching politics and talking about politics and, and looking at the flows of politics in America, given that I've done it as a job for, you know, four and a half years and have been politically involved for my entire adult life. Um, you know, it's a pretty good sign that something's up when everybody's freaking out like that. To me, I think it's emblematic of a bubble popping, that the this is the confirmation of things that more bold uh, and spine-having critics were willing to say when it was, even when it was inconvenient, that uh, it's probably worse than they want to say. If, if even the people who have to build a, a glazed sandwich to say, Joe Biden, you did bad in the debate, if even those people are at the point of having to go, oh my God, that's very concerning. Exactly, Kiwi TP, I've never seen anything like that. I've never seen anything like a public morale break of this level. There's never been one. Not that I can think of at all. You could argue maybe Bernie like losing the uh, losing the nomination or like like dropping out of the race and, and getting ousted by Biden um, for the nomination. But even that was just a section that was depressed. You know what I mean? It was like everybody was mad about a loss. This isn't even a loss. This is a, oh my God, he's not going to be able to win. And we don't know if we have the tools to change course. One of the things... Um, one of the things that uh, one of the things that I've been talking about recently is the illusion, the illusory nature of American electoralism, 
the idea that if you just dump more money in, if you just give more of your time and energy to the Democratic Party, uh, it, everything would have been okay. But we know now that that is so aggressively false, so unbelievably aggressively false. It is, uh, um, it is not even the people with existing positions of power within the Democratic Party don't seem to be able to exercise any of it. And what is the message that that sends to everyone down the line? This is why it's a panic. It's because it's like the equivalent of uh, you you're in a uh, you're in a medieval battle and all of the generals just started running away from the battle. And then all of the colonels start running and then all of the sergeants and the lieutenants and then suddenly everyone's running. For those of us who don't uh, like to build our political lives around thinking about it like a uh, a medieval army structured like a medieval army you know we're just going damn i'm i'm very happy that i'm not inside of there you know but for the rest of the, everybody else they're having a realization of where we've been which is that if you're not already at the top you don't really have much of a say you're being told where to go and what to do and the battle might not really be up to you which is to say there are many other ways to do politics other than joining up in the medieval army style of politics. There are many ways to make yourself and your communities resilient. There are ways to effectively ensure that you are going to be safe, even if things get rough. That you will be safer, even if things get rough. But my message to all of you that I think is of a incredible importance is right now, if you are not already in the process, if you're a politically minded person and you're not already in the process of using your brain juices to think about how and what you will do to survive, if Donald Trump wins in November, get cooking. Get cooking, okay? Get cooking and get connecting, okay? That's what I want you to do. The fight is not even close to over. Okay? We lived through Donald Trump once, okay? It will set, Donald Trump's second term is almost guaranteed to be worse. But there's also the possibility that he takes office and he's too decrepit to do anything. There's also the, the the chance that he takes office and is so bad at managing that he's ineffective, that he's less damaging than he was the first time. There's also the possibility that he takes over and instantly starts working on Project 2025 and America gets a lot worse. But if that's the case, we have to think about what we can do to resist that. I do not believe that people should become doomer and throw their hands up into the air and give up before the fight's over. We've got a lot of room left. We've got a lot of juice left. Even those of us who are struggling right now, there are still so much we can do. And learning to adapt to struggle and to succeed in that struggle, to build power together, is really important. And I want to encourage you who's watching now to start putting your mind towards that in every way you can imagine. And there's a lot of ways to do it. There are almost uncountable ways in which you can improve your own political power situation. You all who are watching me right now are an, an unimaginably diverse group of people. You have talents that I don't even know exist, okay? And those can be used in concert with other people to build political power, to build resilience, to build survival power. And I want you all to do that. I want you all to put your minds to it to the best of your ability, okay?